Why don't we turn tonight to the 17th chapter of Revelation, if you can. And uh, as you're turning there, I want to remind you in the 16th chapter, we were talking about the seventh vial of God's wrath that is being poured out upon the earth in the form of a great earthquake, remember? It declares that the great Babylon uh, came into remembrance before God. God had remembered uh, Babylon to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So now in chapter 17, uh, we see there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show unto you the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy. That is, the beast was full of the names of blasphemy. Having seven heads and ten horns, referring to the beast. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, And when I saw her, John said, I wondered with great amazement, great admiration. And the angel said unto me, why are you marveling? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and ten horns. So, if you were to just dive into Revelation and you would open up the book, and do this uh, kind of a, a open up and dive in and, and try to figure out what is going on here. You might as well close the book. You might as well close the book. You just cannot, from ground zero, open up the 17th chapter of Revelation and begin to know who the woman was, who the, who the mystery of the beast is, and all of the other things. The Bible is written in pro- with progressive revelation meaning that everything builds upon everything else. So when you come to Revelation, the problem with most students of Revelation is that they want to just dive into Revelation. They know nothing about Old Testament theology. They know nothing about the prophecies of Daniel, Zechariah, Isaiah. They know nothing of that, and they want to just interpret Revelation. And the problem over the years, might I say over the centuries, has been that that they find that it's not able, they're not able to interpret it, so they call it, it's a mystery. And they close the book and they say, they even tell their congregations, well, it's, it's something that we just can't know. Do you really believe that God Almighty, the creator of the world, the one who created you and I, put a book in the Bible, allowed a book to be canonized that was going to be an absolute mystery to you that you on this side of earth would never be able to figure out? We have gone through seven, um, pardon me, 16 chapters, and I think we're following it pretty well. I th- I'm amazed at some of you who come to me later and drop me an email and say, you know, I heard thus and such on the radio speak, and I, that's just not right, because I know, I was in Revelation series, and I know that Gog and Magog is way back here, it's not up here, and, and, I, and I appreciate that. It's wonderful to know that you're actually grasping uh, some of this. Anyway. I I digress. After the flood, and Noah and his family had left the ark, okay? They settled in the Babylonian plain. So it was generally accepted that Babylon was the cradle of civilization. Not long after the flood that man began to be corrupted again. And the Bible records in Genesis how that day in Babylon was uh, going to build a tower, remember? They were going to build that tower. Translation, to reach into heaven. It's an unfortunate translation in that 
uh, some have been made to believe that these folks were trying to build a tower so tall that it would reach heaven. Uh, that's not why they were attempting. That's not what they were attempting at all. Not why they were building a tower. They weren't, they weren't building a tower to reach God. They were building a tower to reach their gods. Okay, so the idea of building the tower was that they were, they were looking for a place where they could all commune with the gods, little g. They were pantheistic, and right there was the birthplace of all of the false religious systems that have infected man all throughout his history. That's the birthplace, right there at that tower, the belief in reincarnation. Uh, and, and the belief that if you were good enough to be reincarnated, you know, into a higher order. And, and some men who were very good were reincarnated into the stars of the sky. And they were able to exercise a tremendous influence over the people on the earth. And of course, uh, the influence depending upon which time of the year you were born, which stars you fell under, which stars were rising in their ascendancy in which constellations were dominant at the time of your birth. It was the birthplace of astrology. You're all familiar with some of that. So they began to develop the astrological charts and zodiacs, you know, and the, the whole horoscope thing. And that was the true purpose of the tower, to study the stars and to study the skies and, and to get closer to the gods up there. Uh, to develop the concept for everyone to understand that the uh, influence that the heavens held over your life and to be able to come back with some kind of a template so that if, if I'm born September 17th, I would be able to look at it and say, ah, I am a Virgo. And that means on this date and this time that certain things are in order for my life and now is the time to play the lottery because, you know, I was born on that date. It held influence over your daily decision-making. It held influence over your personality. It held influence over your traits, your characteristics. And they, were, they, were, they, they were, wanted the whole world involved in this system. There in Babylon was a woman who was named Semiramis. Semiramis. Supposedly... Uh, now, as uh, rumor had it, that she, she had a virgin-born son named Nimrod. <clears throat> Nimrod was mentioned in the book of Genesis, and again, a, an unfortunate mistranslation as it referred to him as a mighty hunter before the Lord. Not a good connotation in that Hebrew. Uh, this man was considered evil and was indeed evil. He was a murderer. Yeah, he was a hunter before the Lord. He was a great hunter before the Lord, but he didn't hunt animals. He hunted men. Now, yeah, he did have his little hunting excursions from time to time, but his heart hunted men to kill them. According to legends, Nimrod, who was born on December the 25th, was hunting wild boar uh, when he was turned on by a wild boar and was gored to death. Nimrod supposedly lay there dead for three days, after which life returned to him. Nimrod was celebrated, and his resurrected life was celebrated through the coloring of eggs in the springtime of the year, because eggs were a symbol of perpetuated life, and thus the celebration of his supposed resurrection from the dead. They would color eggs in the springtime to celebrate his resurrection. And so it came to pass that over the years and through the different names, as it moved from country to country, the celebration became Ashtart and became Diana of the Ephesians. Uh, this woman known as the mother of God was worshipped and her son Nimrod, known as the son of God. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, they would worship him. And it would seem that Satan was setting up a counterfeit long before Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. And from Babylon, there arose every false religious system throughout the world. When there was the dividing of the languages and the people were spread all, all over the face of the earth, and at the time of the building of the tower in Babylon, God scrambled their languages so they couldn't complete the project. 
And so uh, if, if Jared and I spoke uh, Hebrew, then Jared and I would be able to understand each other. And so we would, we would get together, and Calvin and Bruce, uh, they spoke Ethiopian. And so they were uh, able to understand each other. And so they would connect over here. Jared and I would connect over here. You folks would connect with, you know, with your native tongue so that you could understand each other. And then you went out from there, and you built civilizations. That's why we've got all of the languages of the world that we have today is because there was a dispersion based upon me being able to understand you or not. And as they, as they dispersed, some men lived in caves. You had to find shelter somewhere. And so they would live, and that's, you know, the, the caveman thing. Uh, uh, yeah, that was, that was kind of real, but it wasn't cavemen like they, the Britannica would depict it. Okay? it was, they were real human beings. But anyway, uh, so some of the basic concepts from the tower were carried all over the world. And so the, the astrology and, and, and all of that was spread in that dispersion throughout the world. It was spread all over the world. So when you study the Inca Indians and the, uh, the ancient Chinese and even some of the primitive cultural groups that still exist today, there's enough similarity to connect them to this common origin, Babylon. When you look at some of the Indians and some of the... Um, uh, the primitive cultures out there, some of the worship and some of the dance, and how it reflects the culture of Babylon. It's amazing how we all kind of connect into that culture. From a biblical standpoint, any false worship of any religion is considered fornication. God created you. God created you that you might fellowship with God. He wanted to fellowship with you. He wanted to commune with you. He wanted to talk with you, you with him. He wanted to guide you in your life. He, he not only created you just and not to abandon you and to, and to say you're on your own now. You've been born. You're on your own. But no, to have an everlasting relationship with him from the moment you were conceived. And the fellowship with God creates within you the worship of God. It creates a worship. Man was made to worship. And there's something innate within all of us that draws us to worship. And if you're not worshiping God, then you are worshiping something else. But you are worshiping something or someone, no matter who you are. Some guys worship their cars. Okay? Some worship their girlfriends. Amen? Some people worship money and other material things. But if you are not worshiping God, you are worshiping something else. If you're not worshiping God first place in your life, then you are worshiping something else first place in your life. And God is a very jealous God. He says, if you are worshiping first place in your life anything other than me, you are committing fornication. Make no mistake. God classified it as pornea, fornication, spiritual adultery. You belong to God by creative rights. You belong to God because he created you. He has the right to control you. He has the right to dictate in your life this, that, or the other, and to use your life, use your body for, for his purpose. He has the right to do that, but he gives you a choice whether or not you want to submit to that. Uh, he he, he uh, wants to use your life or your body for uh, other purposes um, in the kingdom. So some are teachers, some are preachers, some are evangelists, some are prophets, some are witnesses, whatever. But God has a purpose for you. He made you, not just to make you, but for a purpose, and he has a right to use you for that purpose. And to use your life or your body, folks, for any other purpose other than for God and what he wants to do in and through you or serving God 
is taking that which belongs to God by rights, by creative rights, and using it for something else. And the Bible often speaks in a husband-wife relationship concerning God and His people. Jesus and the church, spoken of in a marriage, the bride of Christ, joined unto Him. And as the bride of Christ, our love is supposed to be supremely unto Him. And as the bride of Christ, our love uh, 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 has to be first for Him. So to cast Him as second place to anything else is to commit spiritual adultery. I'm going somewhere with this, but I want to drive the point home so that you absolutely understand where we're going from here. Because we're talking about a woman who has committed fornication here, back here. So I want to, God calls it, He calls it a whoring around on Him. He said uh, in, 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 uh, in Scripture, He says, Oh Israel, I would have, I wanted to do for you but you went a whoring after other gods. He said, I was willing, but you went a whoring after other gods. Fornication. You know, if I was carrying on with some other woman other than my wife, I would be committing adultery or fornication. So for you to be carrying on with some other master passion in your life other than Jesus Christ To you, it is spiritual adultery, and to God, it is fornication. He wants not a a place in your life. He wants and deserves and desires preeminence, not place. Not just any old place, but preeminence, first place. And thus, we read these terms so often, as man is worshiping false gods and serving false religions. When Israel began to worship Baal and Moloch and Mammon and all, God called them out. And he did so in order that future generations like us could clearly see his standard and his expectation of a faithful relationship to him. He is a jealous God. Oh, he is a jealous God. He loves you so wonderfully, so incredibly. He gave everything he had. He did everything that he could do to make sure that you could be with him forever. He loves you that much. And he doesn't want to see you taking off and, and, and go, uh, pardon the phrase, go a whoring around after other things besides him. He remains faithful to you. I want to remind you, church, God remains 100% faithful to you at all times. He said, I will never, no, never, no, not never, ever leave you nor forsake you. I will never abandon you. I will never commit fornication on your part, ever. I am completely devoted to completely faithful to you. That's the God you serve. And he expects you to remain completely faithful to him. Isn't it fair? He gave everything that he had. Now, the beast here. The beast here represents the state. It represents uh, the government. And the woman represents the religious system. Notice that in the figure here, John sees the woman is riding on the scarlet-covered beast. I'm going, to help you, I'm going to explain this and help you out here. There's always been some debate as to whether man is ruled by the state or man is ruled by a religious system. So there were times where the church sought to rule over the state, and there's a constant conflict as to whether the church is ruled by the state or the church rules over the state. I do not believe that it is God's intention or His will or ever has been God's intention or will, that the church would rule over the state. Never believed that. I am a firm believer in the separation of church and state. I don't believe the state has any right to tell the church what they can or cannot do. Amen? That, that, that shall not take place until Jesus Christ comes to rule and reign here on this earth and we with him. But there remains that conflict between church and state, but also between religions and state. 
And look at the big problem in India today, the Sikhs and the uh, Hindus, both, both uh, uh, seeking to rule. Uh, Pakistan, because it was basically Muslim, separated from India due to religion. In Iran, in Iraq, you have two, uh, two nations separated over differences between Sunni and the Shiite religions. It's all Muslim, but it's, it's different factions. The whole region over there remains loyal to one side or the other. Either uh, they're Sunni or they're uh, Shiite. False religious systems. And basically, in religion, you have man's endeavor to reach God. That's what religion is. Man's endeavor to reach God some way, somehow. If I should have to draw a picture of religion, I would draw a round circle representing planet Earth, and I would put upon it a little stick man, because that's the only kind of man I can draw. I would put upon it a little stick man with his hands raised heavenward. And there you have a picture of religion. Man standing here on earth, trying to reach God by some way, shape, or form. Beginning with an earth base, there you have the Tower of Babel. As they built this tower, they tried to communicate with these little gods in the heavens, starting with an earth base and trying to reach God from that earth base. You can't do it, dear friend. You can't do it. You, how can a finite man, with all of his limitations, begin with an earth base and build a bridge to infinity to reach God. How can man do that? He can't. That's why every religion is doomed to failure. That's why God isn't interested in religion. He's interested in relationship. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. Satan loves religion. He loves it. But religion cannot bring you to God. They can make their promises. Buddha said, your only problem, man, is that, that you have all these material desires out here. And material things are evil. And as long as you have material desires, you will never be in peace. And if you want to attain this state of nirvana, where all is peace and bliss, then you have to rid yourself of all material desires. Food is material. So among the things that you must lose as you ascend through Buddhism is your desire for food. You're going to fast, and you're going to fast, and you will fast throughout your journey just to be sure that you have lost your material desire for food. And it's tragic because I have never yet met a Buddhist who has attained nirvana, ever. They're always on the journey, they tell me. I'm on the journey, but they've never attained it. I've never talked to one who's attained it. And it's always just a quest for them. No one ever arrives all of their life. One big quest for nirvana. Christianity is in direct opposition to religion. It is in direct opposition in that Christianity teaches that God is seeking to reach man not man from an earth base seeking to reach God. It isn't man reaching out for God. It's God reaching out to man. You don't start with an earth base and try to reach an infinite God. You start with an infinite God reaching down to finite man. For God so loved the world, listen, that he gave his only begotten son, that's God initiating, God reaching out to man, and though I have a problem with finite man reaching God, I don't have a problem with an infinite God reaching finite man. I can understand that. I can understand a, a, a finite man reaching an infinite God, but I can understand a, a, an infinite God reaching finite man. Makes sense. <clears throat> an, infinite, an infinite God can do anything. It would be nothing at all for an infinite God to touch a finite man. But a finite man to touch an infinite God? You can't see it. Which, according to the scriptures, God did touch us. He touched us 
through Jesus Christ. Amen? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John said, that which was from the beginning, which we have seen, which we have heard, and which we have touched. God became touchable through His Son, Jesus Christ. Not through Buddhism, not through Hinduism, uh, not through any other religion, but only through His Son, Jesus Christ, can we touch God. Now, there has been a path, a bridge made from finite man to infinite God, and the bridge, the name of that bridge is Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son. Amen. Unfortunately, even in the church, corruption and religion began to set in. Religion always likes to establish rituals and methodologies, whereas uh, where, where the woman of Samaria was asking Jesus how one might reach God and worship God, and Jesus told her that God is a spirit, and man must worship him, how? In spirit and in truth. But man developed through religions, the formulas, the rituals, and so forth, by which man could reach God. And these things invaded the church. The church began to adopt some of these crazy formulas. Before you know it, the church had allowed false religion into its midst. So the time has come in the book of Revelation here, where this mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, now must be judged. God has had it. He's let her go this long, and now he's going to judge her. This is the, we're in the seventh vial, that seventh bold judgment. And so this is the time where God says, enough. This whole religious system, listen, the one that we talked about that began, had its birth way back there at the Tower of Babel and has built into false religions all over the world that we're seeing today. This whole religious system out here comes riding in on the beast. All of it. Every other way in the world except through Jesus Christ to get to God comes riding in on the beast, all these religions. And it isn't long before the beast turns on it and begins to destroy it. The beast is identified as having the seven heads and ten horns. So, this beast uh, that is identified, we know from Daniel, will be the final world governing power. In Daniel, he had a vision of the kingdoms that was going to rule the world, beginning with the Babylonian kingdom, which was conquered by the Medo-Persian Empire, which was conquered by the Grecian Empire, which was conquered by the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was this beast that he could not describe, and out of this beast there came ten horns. The beast had seven heads, and out of it came ten horns. So the final governing empire will, will sort of be a revival of the Roman Empire. The European Federation, along with the United States and Japan, forming together this powerful military and political plot. The European Federation along with the United States and Japan, forming together this powerful military plot. We see in Europe today that formation of the various governments is in what is called the European Union. We see that. And you go to Europe and you see one money and, and the same socialist government. Really, it's all part of the prophetic picture of the Bible. Uh, setting the stage for the final act. The world-dominating empire. The revival of the Roman Empire. You'll see the, you will see the day where the United... Well, I don't know that you'll see the day, but maybe we'll be gone. Hopefully, we'll be gone. But the day will come when the United States will join the European Federation. And it will be one currency. Where we'll, the dollar will be no good anymore, and we're going to be joining the EU. We'll be joining that federation. Now, I, I don't know if that's going to be tomorrow or after the Lord comes or when. Well, who knows? But that's going to happen, according to the Bible. This woman clothed in scarlet and purple, comes riding in. woman representing this false religious system comes riding in upon this whole system of the Antichrist. For the Antichrist will ultimately control over this beast. The Antichrist 
will control all religion. There'll be one religion. So you have the beast in two forms. The beast is referred to as the kingdom, which is the federation of the ten nations that we just talked about. But the beast is also referred to as an individual, the Antichrist. So whether the beast is being referred to as the individual or the kingdom out of which he rises and reigns depends upon the context of Scripture. So as John was looking at this whole scene and just standing there in amazement, the angel says, why are you standing there marveling? I'll tell you what the mystery is. He says, uh, what the secret is of this woman and the beast that carries her. And here we're going to get into it right here. <clears throat> Pardon me. Just... The angel tells John, the beast that you saw was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. I'm going to say it slowly. <clears throat> it's a riddle. It's a mystery, but we're going to explain the mystery. The beast that you saw was, okay, and is not, that's was in the past, is not in the present, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen. One is, the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goes into perdition. Anybody lost yet? Come on. Anybody lost? <laughs> We've got one honest person out here. <laughs> the rest of you need to repent. <laughs> so, so the description of the beast, sort of cryptic, would you say? Uh, and, and here's the Lord who says, now wait a minute, he says, I see you struggling. I see you struggling with all of this. He says, I'm going to explain it to you. So, take a breath, listen. And he gives us some clues to work with. He says, first of all, the beast that John saw was, means he had existed, and is not, isn't existing now, but he's going to ascend out of the abyss, the abuso. Now, in the earlier part of our study, we read where a star fell from heaven, having the key to the abyss. The abyss is a shaft. That is what the literal meaning is, shaft. That evidently goes from the surface of the earth to the interior of the earth into what is called Hades, which is in the center of the earth. Whereas, Hades is the place of incarceration for the wicked dead. This abuso, this abyss, is the place of incarceration for evil spirits. You have Hades, you have the abyss. No doubt, those fallen angels who rebelled with Satan when he rebelled against God, those evil spirits, uh, their place is in the abyss. That's the incarceration place. So in Luke's gospel, oh, this is going to get good. In Luke's gospel, it tells the story of Jesus coming with his disciples uh, to the country of the Gadarenes. And it's across the Sea of Galilee where they set out by boat and they got caught in that ferocious storm, if you remember, when Jesus calmed the seas, remember? And there was living there in the tombs outside the city there a man who was possessed with evil spirits, extremely violent, ferocious. No one could get near him. I mean, if they did... He'd come out and he literally tried to kill them. Uh, they tried to chain him up, put chains on him. He would break the chain. Extremely powerful under the influence of these demonic spirits. And when Jesus and his disciples landed in their little ship, well, this man, this evil, uh, evil uh, demon-possessed man, runs out towards them in a menacing manner. And Jesus said, listen, to the demons, <laughs> not the man. He said to the demons, 
He spoke right through the man, right to the demons. And he says to the demons, I mean, here's, this, here's this man running right at him. And Jesus says, what is your name? Stopped immediately. What is your name? All of a sudden, I can see the man's lip beginning to quiver. Man? We, we, are, we are legion, but we are many. Jesus stared at him. Suddenly, they begged Jesus not to send them to the Abuso, not to send them to the abyss before their time. And there was a herd of swine adjacent to them, grazing on the hillside. And Jesus saw them and must have thought, I can't think of a better place to send these demons than a bunch of pigs. <laughs> you know my love for pigs and swine. Jesus said, come out of the man. Come out of him. And immediately they had to obey him. They were subject to him. They came out. They went into that herd of swine. Went down the hill. Remember, off the cliff. Drowned in the water below. But the demons knew that they would be sent one day to the bottomless pit and they begged Jesus not to send them there before it was time. For they knew that it would be Jesus who sent them there ultimately. They knew that already. It's interesting that the beast that John saw was, he was living and is not, he's, he, he isn't living now. But when he comes onto the scene, he's going to arise from that abuso. But then will be sent to Gehenna, ultimately to Gehenna, the lake of fire. Perdition. Gehenna is the lake of fire. Hell is not the lake of fire. Hell the lake of, contains the lake of fire, but the final resting place for Satan and all of those human beings who choose to follow him and reject Jesus Christ will be sent to the lake of fire, to Gehenna. Jesus in Matthew 25, when he comes to judge the nations, he says, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, into Gehenna's fires that were prepared for Satan and his angels. Talking to man now. And those who choose to ally with him will be cast there with Satan. The ultimate end of those who refuse to accept the Lord Jesus Christ and all of the suffering and the wrath that he absorbed on that cross for you all that he took in your place and you spat on him and you rejected him and you wagged your finger in, uh, in front of him and said, no, there's nothing else to do with you. Are you listening tonight? Those of you online, are you listening? When you do that, there's nothing else to do with you. You have chosen to reject Jesus and therefore you have chosen to follow Satan. You cannot serve two masters. You'll serve Jesus or you will serve Satan. And they will go wherever Satan goes. Hence, many men will find their place in the fires of Gehenna. And not one man in the fires of Gehenna will ever ask, How did I get here? For you will know. You will know, you will have an eternity of reminding and reminding and reminding yourself of the many opportunities you had to say yes to Jesus and you would not because of your ignorant pride. And you will be where you will be. I, I, I love how King Solomon says it, when a tree falls to the west, in the place that the tree lands, whether it be the west or the east, wherever it lands, that's the place it's going to stay. That's where you will be. When the trumpet sounds, that will be the... That, you're, you, folks, if you're going to get saved in the tribulation, if you're waiting for the tribulation to get saved, you're making a horrible mistake. Fatal. 
it will cost you your life, and you don't get to choose the method. It will cost you everything. Dear God, help us. Jesus describes it as a place of outer darkness. He said it is a place where there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said, where the worm dieth not. Gehenna is described in Revelation as a lake burning with fire, smoke ascending forever and ever eternally. You can make of that whatever you want to make of it. Personally, I let it alone. God said what he meant. He meant what he said. I don't try to modify it. I don't try to understand it. I don't try to explain it out. I'm telling you what Scripture says. And then the Lord begins to identify a little more thoroughly here the seven hills. Verse 9. Here's the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains upon which the woman sits. The early historians always identified uh, Tacitus and others, especially those who wrote about the same time that John wrote in that period, always referred to Rome as the city of seven hills. So the Lord is showing us now that Rome is the place where the woman sits. Seven heads are the seven mountains. There are seven kings. Five are fallen. One is now. So one will come along, reign for a short period, but the eighth is one of the seven. So there were seven major emperors of Rome in history. The beast that you saw was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, the Abuso, and go into Gehenna, the perdition. It would seem, here is wisdom, it would seem that the beast, the Antichrist, would be one of the five Roman emperors who had reigned previous to the time that John was writing the book of Revelation. As I've mentioned before, the closest candidate that you can come up with would be Caesar Nero. And I'm not suggesting that Nero will be resurrected. No, I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm suggesting and uh, neither am I suggesting that he will come back alive. I'm suggesting that the same demonic spirit that controlled Nero will be the same demonic spirit that will control this Antichrist, making, in a sense, Caesar Nero all over again. Nero started out pretty good. Roman emperor, a pretty decent guy. Then a change took place about the time he met the Apostle Paul. Paul had appealed to Caesar during one of his trials. It was uh, the right of every Roman citizen to appeal to Caesar. So Caesar, off he went to Caesar. And now we know that uh, you know, he, every judge that Paul stood uh, before, he endeavored to convert to Christianity. We, we know that through Scripture. Paul would lay his witness on him, man. He'd, he'd tell them that, you know, at one time, I would have rather killed Christians than to look at them. He would say, but, but he would look, and then he would say to them, then I met the Lord. Then I met the Lord, and he would commence to really lay it on thick, giving them his greatest witness, great testimony. And it seemed that the higher the person was whom he stood before, the more he would put, them, put, put the witness on them. So that when he finally got to King Agrippa, he says, Oh, King Agrippa, I love this. King Agrippa, I count it an honor, he says, to finally get to stand before such a just king. And one who understands the scripture. Can you see Paul saying this to the king? King's sitting, uh, king is always up here, you know, and Paul's down here. And he's saying, one, I, I find it a privilege to be able to come before you today, uh, especially knowing how well you know the scriptures. Uh, he said, the prophecies uh, that you know, and you've studied the scriptures, and I am blessed today to be able to share with you, king. And as he testified before the king, I'm sure in Paul's heart, he was thinking, man, if I could convert this guy, what an influence he could have. Paul began his presumptive closing, and, and they call it um, presumptive closing in business is what he was doing. He said, King Agrippa, do you believe the same scriptures that you have long studied? It didn't even let him answer it. He says, I know you believe them, O king. And Paul begins to share deep revelations with the king, and the prosecuting attorney, Festus, stands up and says, uh, after 30, 40 minutes of this uh, ranting by Paul and witnessing to the king, and the king's, he's got the king's ear. Prosecuting attorney, full of the devil, Festus, stands up and says, Paul, stop! He says, actually, in the Greek, shut up! 
Shut up. You become a man completely out of your mind. You don't even know what you're saying. The king says, Paul, you, you have almost convinced me to become a believer. Paul said, would that you would, your honor, become a follower of Jesus. So then his appeal went from there on up the chain, and next was Caesar Nero. I'll bet Paul was ecstatic about the opportunity to stand before Nero. He'd heard an awful lot about him. And I'll bet the Holy Spirit of God was so strong upon this man when he spoke that it pierced the, the heart of old King Nero. I wish the Bible would have recorded that one. I would have loved to have heard that exchange. Uh, and Nero, coming face to face with the claims of Jesus Christ, had to make a decision. He was forced into a decision. And unfortunately, his decision was wrong. He rejected the Lord. And at the same time, historically, he had a change of personality. I believe his rejection had resulted in demonic possession. At the point where he rejected Jesus, he became demonically possessed. In fact, I have no doubt. He released Paul. Paul continued on to Ephesus, ministered to the saints and all, but then he was rearrested, brought back to Nero, and Nero then didn't release him, but he had him beheaded. Paul's mission, his ministry was complete, and he was beheaded. Paul's mission, everything was done, but Nero, oh my friend, Nero became a maniac. His persecution of the Christians was second to none. He would take Christians and kill them, hang them on stakes through his garden covered them with tar and lit their bodies at night as, as the Christians would burn on these stakes and he, he would ride naked on his chariot screaming uh, throughout his garden uh, that was being lit by burning Christians. The guy was a maniac. He was demon possessed, best known of course for setting the entire city of Rome on fire. He burned Rome down because he wanted to rebuild it. A madman. Horrible demon, a horrible, strong demon took control of Nero's life. And I believe that same demon that took control of Nero's body is today incarcerated in the Abuso and will come out of the Abuso and incarcerate the ruler of this ten-nation federation. The same maniacal demon will get to rule and reign again only for a short time before it is cast into the lake of fire. Interesting that the people of Nero's time called him the beast because of how horrible his torture of the Christians were. The lions, the stretching, and the whole bit. Uh, interesting that the name of Caesar Nero in Hebrew, Hebrew totals 666. The number of a man, and his number is 666. So the Lord seeks to identify here for us in verse 11. Stay with me. Stay with me. Verse 11. And the beast that was... Nero ruled at one time, the beast that was and is not, he's no longer alive when John wrote this, even he is the eighth. This Antichrist will be technically the eighth leader of the Roman Empire and is of the original seven rulers of the Roman Empire, which Nero indeed was. He was one of the seven original uh, rulers. So the eighth, this Antichrist, will be another man apart from the original seven, but the demonic spirit that possesses him will be one that had possessed one of the seven prior emperors. Again, I don't see how it could be anyone other than Nero. The same demon that possessed Nero, I believe, will possess the Antichrist. And here we find his end as we conclude the rest of the verse. And goeth into perdition, he will be cast into the lake of fire. Up from the Abuso, into the Antichrist, given his short time here, he will rule, and then he will be ultimately cast into the lake of fire. That would be the mystery of all that we had just read. Take it for what it is. It's, it's, it's my conclusion. You can make it yours if you like. If you have another conclusion, God bless you. Then he goes on to say in verse 12, the ten horns which thou saw are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet but received power as kings for one hour with the beast. So when the European community finally comes together to take over as the world dominating power, and they will, rulers of these ten nations will come together to rule for one hour and these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. 
These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for He's the Lord of hosts. Amen? And King of kings. And they that are with Him, us, are called and chosen and faithful. And we're going to get into all that next week, that final conflict and the victory of Jesus Christ. We'll get into all of that uh, next week. Again, I want to say, let me go back real quick, and I want to read it slowly. The beast that you saw was, means he had been at one time. He is not right now. He's in the Abuso, but he shall ascend out of the Abuso and go into Gehenna ultimately. That, my friend, I believe, is the spirit, the demonic spirit of Caesar Nero. We are going to see possess Antichrist in the last days. 